really two come to mind. Uh, the first was a little bit over a year ago, and that was the passage of a new school funding formula that obviously directly impacted everybody in this room, really everybody across the state. And uh, the, another, and I, these kind of tie together even though they're in different subject matter areas, but another was uh, we passed a significant bill um, that had to do with uh, hospital uh, provider taxes, so a major uh, portion of funding the state's Medicaid program. And the reason that I cite those two as key examples is because in both of those cases, like I talked about with the budget, uh, we had true bipartisan uh, effort that, that led to both of those being successful bills that got overwhelming support in both chambers uh, and were signed by the governor. And I, I think that um, when we look for what's successful, what's really going well in Springfield versus what's not going well in Springfield, it helps to take a little bit bigger picture view than maybe just one piece of legislation or whether you liked or didn't like an aspect of that, that piece of legislation. For a number of years, and, and we've seen you know, over uh, in the last few years with the budget had passed, but even years prior to that with um, some of this, uh, the uh, rivalry for power that's happened between different branches of government or um, you know, sort of pitting one side against the other in, in political races. Um, I think that when we can find a process that works and we can make improvements to the process of how government happens in Springfield, that's the most positive thing that, that I can see. And so in both the example on the, the Medicaid funding bill and the school funding bill, um, those were the results of good old fashioned government work. <laughs> that, was, that was folks on both sides of the aisle rolling up their sleeves and, and getting down to, to business. And so I always try to bring those examples up because when we talk about the significant problems that remain in Illinois, the significant problems that we have in you know, forming next year's budget or the, the couple of large pieces of legislation that will come before each of our chambers in the next year, I think we have to apply those successful templates if we want to come up with a similar successful result. Um, so again, I, I, from my perspective, it's looking a little bit uh, more at how the how the bill came into, came into being rather than just what the specific uh, aspects of that one piece of legislation were. Thanks, Tom. Um, couldn't agree more. I mean, the evidence-based funding and also the hospital assessment bills are probably the two biggest bills uh, passed. Um, I'd like to talk about, I think, something that uh, Jennifer Tiener and Front and I are both passionate about, that's a teacher shortage issue and what got done there. And I'm just going to talk about some details of some things I worked on, but I want to say it in a way that helps you folks think about how you can make change in Springfield. I've been doing something I call citizen legislating. And it's very common, in fact, I was at a town hall meeting one night and people gave me four things to go work on. And I said, uh, I'm not going to do any of those. <laughs> if you think one of those is you're passionate about, you need to work on it and I'll help you get it there. And uh, that sound, people say, wait a minute, that's your job. Well, it's not our job to run around and not get anything done. It works when we have citizens that engage in the process. I want to tell you how this works. I had a bill, uh, I got a call from a lady named Molly Palmer, uh, school board member in Galesburg. Uh, she uh, was frustrated as a mom because her children were not getting enough dual credit hours. And I said, Molly, if you'll, you, you understand it better than I do, and you're more passionate about it than I do, if you're willing to come to me with your ideas, I will get you to the right rooms at the right time and we passed a really good dual credit bill this past year because of Molly Palmer, not because of what I was doing on it. I did the same thing with the teacher shortage. And uh, I have an education advisory committee in my district, 10, uh, one person from each county, and Jody Scott, ROE, chairs that for me. Great people. And uh, we sat down and started working on teacher shortage, came up with 41 ideas for possible solutions. Work those down to the three low hanging fruit that was also running on the house side at the same time. And the bill that you folks saw that passed came out of that effort and then working with Jennifer Bertino Tron and uh, Andy Nar, who uh, really helped get that passed. And uh, specifically, this ability for teachers that are retired to come back in the classroom for more hours, uh, a substitute teacher standard that has a five year sunset to try and take some of the pressure off of. You know, in my meeting this morning, someone asked, how many of your schools are short on substitute teachers? Exactly. And how many of you have a teacher shortage this year going on right now? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Uh, the third area was uh, reciprocity for bringing teachers in from out of the state. So those were three things that did not cost any money, were low-hanging fruit, that took some pressure off, but they're not permanent solutions, okay? Another bill was, uh, a basic skills test we talk about a lot. 
21% passed the basic skills test last year. Teachers wanting to be, people wanting to be teachers. That used to be a 90% number. They raised the standard because we all want better teachers. Well, they raised it so far, teachers couldn't get through the pipeline. So now that, uh, we changed the time on that bill this past year. Now I'm pleased with ISBE has actually removed that test and is going to come, we'll come in with a new test a year from now after your study to try to figure out how we're really testing for the right thing. So um, those were a couple things. Uh, I had one other thing, manufacturing uh, apprenticeships, where we got that passed this year. Now, I'm a minority party, but working with the majority party, we can get a lot done if it's just a good logical sense. Yeah, and I don't have much to add. I think we've hit, hit our highlights. But I'm going to address Senator Weaver's point about getting some of these education bills done and being in the minority party. Um, with anything we do in the, in the legislation, it is about working together. And I think it's personalities, too. And we're very fortunate we work together for a greater cause. I think education it kind of draws the, you know, we're not as partisan among education. Every politician, Republican, Democrat, federal level, local level, state level, all we talk about is education, the importance of education, um, and the needs of our community and our students. And I think together we are able to show that we're putting our money where our mouth is. Um, it's not about ownership, it's about the bigger picture and getting things done. I do, I think we've accomplished a lot of really good things um, in the education committee, and I talk, we've, we've probably listened to or at least filed over 200 bills, and it's every year. I always say we, we never get a break, we have to meet every week, um, it's, it's never less than an hour long, and if it's an hour long, if it's, a, if it's a good day, because everyone is passionate about education. And so to accomplish things such as dual credit, um, teacher reciprocity, the apprenticeship program, which I just, I love, um, I think it, it says a lot to the working relationship of people in the committee as well. You can't be an obstructionist in the education committee because it's just not gonna, it's not gonna work. You have to think of the, the, the greater good. So I'm just proud of the fact that we were able to accomplish such big things in that committee and I think we're gonna have a, a full agenda moving forward next year as well. We're gonna be talking about early childhood, school safety, which I know many of you have attended uh, seminars. Educator misconduct has been a big issue that we started and see, we've heard of with our um, <coughs> hearings at CPS that is, is trickling down. Uh, and teacher shortage. Uh, the State Board of Education has come out with a, a seven point um, assessment and I do believe we will be talking about those um, all through the next General Assembly. All right, thank you. The, the next thing I, I guess, if we were here a year from today, uh, what are those issues that are still outstanding uh, that you see uh, as major challenges uh, and things that need to be addressed in education moving forward? You're sure. Up. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't want to take all of it, so I'm just going to touch on uh, there's the seven issues. How many are you familiar with the uh, your review that just happened and focus on teacher shortage and the seven recommendations came out of the Raise your hands if you are, so I kind of know how deep we have to go. Uh, there's a few of those I'm passionate about, and I'll, I'll address those. Uh, for myself, uh, dual credit, we got part of it done. We were not able to get online dual credit achieved, and that's, been my, that's my main focus this year. Um, if you think back to when you first had an opportunity to do uh, distance learning, let's call it, where you're learning from someone who's not a teacher standing in front of you. Think back to what year that is. And I doubt many of you thought 1968. But think about the cart they rolled in with the TV on it that was going to connect that allowed us to learn from outside the classroom. It never got turned on because the technology wasn't there. We don't have that excuse anymore. We have phenomenal technology and we need to be using online more, not only for AP, which we just had a great pilot done in our state that one of the schools in my district would like them to be part of. There's great opportunities there. There's also great opportunities for online from a dual credit perspective that we need to be focused on. So that's going to be personally. I think with regard to uh, things that ISB is going to be wanting to see, you know, State Board of Education is going to want to see, and the seven items that came out of it, uh, the two items that I personally want to push from a licensure perspective. And uh, it was fun in the last meeting I did like this. Uh, it was 10 o'clock this morning. I saw half the heads going this way and half the heads going that way. So we're going to have a lot of work to do on it. But it's about 
licensure and how do we, we have this teacher shortage, school boards need to have the ability to try to do what they've got to do to get teachers in the classroom. How do we give them some more flexibility? I mean, I got to hire people they don't want. How do we get more people available to them? So there's two areas. I know uh, my Detroit public schools at home have been working very hard on the grow your own program and also working with people who have been paraprofessionals. How do we get them licensed and into a classroom when they don't have the ability to take three years, four years to go to college to actually get their teaching degree? So there are some ways that these recommend do that. Also, if you think about a person who's been a professional, let's say an accountant, for example, or an engineer, and he's at a point in life where he wants to do career change, how do we allow them to come into a classroom without having to go back for a three-year licensure program? So those would be two bills that I'm uh, personally focused on. Both of them, I think, and the Illinois State Board of Education has found a pretty good balance between not making sure, uh, making sure that we don't allow of quality to go down while we're also dealing with this teacher shortage to get people in the classroom. Thank you. I think over the next 12 months, the most significant challenge that will face the state will be similar to what we've heard previous years, and that's the state budget. It's making all the numbers work to fund the programs and services across the state that we want to fund uh, and support. Um, when we think about some of the pressures that, that are on the state budget today, they, they're really the same that we've been struggling with for many years. We still have uh, billions of dollars in unpaid bills from previous years, services and uh, programs that were funded and provided in previous years. We still have to try to make a, a catch-up payment and get those, those services paid for. Um, we still have uh, carry uh, over $100 billion in unfunded pension liabilities. That leads to a significant growth in what your annual required contribution is to the state's pension program. Additionally, uh, there was a, a recent revision by the teacher's retirement system, the largest of the state's five pension systems, that uh, increased their request for next year's pension um, contribution by $400 million uh, next year. Uh, add to that then the uh, scheduled increase in the, the uh, evidence-based funding formula of $350 million. Uh, we're talking about significant dollars just in the education space. Not to mention the growth that we've that everybody sees in, in the cost of providing health care services um, through to both state employees uh, and to uh, the state's Medicaid program. Um, there's a court ruling that's uh, of over four hundred million dollars in uh, required wage increases to state employees um, through a, an AFSCME, AFSCME contract negotiation. So we have some significant pressures that are that are building up before we even kind of talk about is there anything new that's going to happen. Uh, for example, there's been a lot of um, uh, support, uh, bipartisan support over the years to try to do a capital infrastructure bill um, to, to make investments in infrastructure across the state of Illinois. Um, so that's, that's in the new spending category. But I think we really have a, a difficult position with um, trying to make all our current programs, given their natural growth, uh, fit into the, the um, revenue constraints that we have right now. Now, you might think, well, maybe, you know, uh, as Senator Weaver mentioned, Governor Lech Pritzker has been supportive of a graduated income tax, uh, but that's not something that can happen quickly. Even if it does happen, it can't, it can't happen immediately. It's a, it's a constitutional amendment, has to be passed by the legislature, be put on a ballot, and you all and voters across the state have to weigh in on that. So that's really not something that can help in year one. So as we, as we sit down and uh, start to, you know, sort of add up this list of, um, of growth in spending in areas through a variety of different pressures that we're facing, um, I think the state budget is going to be very difficult for us to uh, for us to come up with this year. Um, we're we're certainly going to work on it. It's one of the, the uh, primary jobs of the legislature. Uh, but I, I have to say that you know if we're sitting here in a year and we found a way to make the state budget work in a reasonable way, that'd be a significant accomplishment. It's uh, it's going to take a lot of hard work, and I know that a lot of people are starting to do some of the at least the back of the envelope math to say, all right, what are we kind of looking with, looking at for next year? And, um, and it does look like we have a, quite a bit of pressure, um, even in order to keep the kind of commitments that we have out there already. Yeah, I'll go with uh, Representative Denver said. There's no doubt that the budget is always, every year, it's going to be our, our number one priority. Um, that is the crest of what we are there to do in order to government to run efficiently. However, it does not, um, from a school perspective, uh, while the budget is worked out, it doesn't impede what we have to do in, in education. And some of the goals that Senator Weaver has, has laid out are all things that are important. And because we have a budget, that's never going to go away. 
government still goes on and we are going to still need to address some of the concerns that we face as, as educators. Uh, we are going to still have to move ahead with teacher shortage. We are still going to have to talk about early childhood funding, um, school safety. These are all issues that um, despite the budget that has to come every year and is always number one and I think the governor-elect um, when he was asked what's the first thing you're going to do, um, he, he said we are going to start working on, on the budget. Um, that is always our, pro our priority, but rest assured does not impede the things that we have to do in the school community as well. All right, thank you. So uh, just finally before uh, we'll get to the audience questions, I just wanted to, um, I hope everybody here got that D in civics and at least voted. So. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, uh, we, we've just recently come through an election, and I uh, just wanted to get uh, these uh, folks' input on uh, the changes uh, that are going to come to the General Assembly and to the Executive Branch and how uh, they see that impacting uh, schools and education. Start you get to start. <laughs> <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> I'm elated. I'm very, uh, I'm very obviously happy with the, the turnout. I think for all of us, Republican, Democrat, it's been a hard, a hard four years. And while I, I do not agree with everything that Governor Luck Pritzker has said, I can tell you my experience with him has been of an open dialogue. He knows exactly where we we differ on um, what. What thrills me, though, is his commitment to education. He was a early childhood proponent before he ran for governor. I think we are, I, well, I know we are going to continue to see his commitment in public education, which I think in this room is, is very important. Um, he's going, he has not started his education transition team. He has not identified that, but with the, with the new governor um, and a different party, a transition team always exists. So I, is under my understanding that it's going to be rolled out um, November 27th. If it's anything like he's done with his other transition teams, it's a bipartisan effort, which is very po uh, positive. Um, and I, again, what I'm, I'm understanding is going to be broken down. We're going to all come together, the K through 12, higher ed, community colleges, as well as vocational ch training, all things that are important to the governor. Uh, and, and, you know, with, with respect, Senator, I, I'm not sure that I could use the word elated to describe my reaction on election night. Uh, as, you know, as a, as a Republican in the House, uh, we lost a significant number of seats um, and changed the, changed the balance um, in the, there's still a couple of races that haven't been called yet. For any civics teacher in the, in the room, there's a, a race in Lake County, a, a state house race in Lake County over 50,000 ballots cast, and I think the margin right now is three, three. So um, as you can imagine, you know, there's uh, over on Tuesday of this upcoming week is when uh, election results are certified, and so we'll see some of those races that are, that's not even the only one that's in, you know, in double digits, or, or, that's not even in double digits, single digits, and there's a couple more that are, you know, only a couple dozen votes that are separating the, um, the two candidates. So uh, there's potential for even more changes happening, but um, what, what's, uh, you know, as we look forward, I think we're, we're certainly looking at uh, the outcome of the election through sort of how did it affect some of our colleagues in each of our caucuses. Um, but in addition to, you know, people who, who either won or lost re-election, there were a lot of new faces on the ballot, um, a lot of retirements, especially in the House, a significant number of, of legislators of both parties did not run for re-election. And so we end up with, um, 20 some new members, you know, out of a body of 118, 20 some new members. Uh, many of you know what it's like when there are new members who join a school board or new members uh, you know, hire a new superintendent, you get a new uh, administrative team in place. Um, they're just new people to, to figure out uh, what, what do they bring to the table, what's their approach going to be, what are some of the new strengths that they have, some of the areas that they're going to be interested in working with. Um, we have we'll have a lot of that uh, a lot of people going through that new learning curve in the in the upcoming year. Um, as for the the governor elect, uh, you know the, the transition teams that he's put together so far have been you know they've been very comprehensive. There, there's a lot of people from very different groups. For example, the, the healthcare team was unveiled a couple days ago. It really had a lot of different people who touched some aspect of healthcare put together. And I and I hope that the, something similar is coming for education where. You can really get different kinds of stakeholders around the table together. 
Um, as legislators, you know, as somebody who's fortunate to, to have been reelected uh, last uh, a week, two weeks ago, um, it's our job to say, now with the new people who the people of Illinois have elected to do their work, how can we try to get things done together? Uh, no matter what party we're a part of, um, I, I think we all, it's all, um, it's our obligation to reach out to members of the opposite party, to the new administration, and try to give our best uh, effort to work in a good faith manner uh, to get things done. So, you know, even though uh, you sort of have uh, your, the political side of your life and then the legislative side of your life, um, and you might be upset over what happened on, from the political angle, um, that legislative angle requires that we, we roll up our sleeves and do our best we can. I certainly look forward to uh, working with the new folks who uh, will come in and play a significant role in the direction of the state going forward. I think we can, uh, as I mentioned earlier, succeed best when we try to do things in a bipartisan way. Thanks, State Representative. Um, I was just making a couple notes here, get my thoughts together. And uh, so people say, what do you think is going to happen? I've been there three years. I've never been down this road before. So I was thinking, you all know about as well as I do what's going to happen with regard to the dynamics of one party control over uh, uh, both the House, the, the Senate, and uh, the governorship. But as I was, as you were talking about the change in seats, something a little more ominous hit me. Uh, I went in as the 22nd uh, uh, newest uh, Senate Republican, and as of this election, I'm the ninth. That's how much change of business. So you think this thing I said earlier about citizen legislating, where it takes people of knowledge, we're still just folks down there, and I'm one of the nine veterans been there three years. So uh, that does take all you folks being involved. That's why we need to have your calls, why we need to have you engaged. And when we're done today, come up, we want advice from you, things you're hearing to say. But um, I have a hope, and that is, I, I use this chart probably every time I speak, and I'm sorry I had it on PowerPoint this morning. But it shows our bond rating since 1982, over here at the very top corner, uh, to now uh, 2015 going from a triple A to a triple B minus. Now, a lot of the battle between Governor Brown and Speaker Madden was over that chart. And I believe that both sides know the problem with that chart. But I think no one was willing to let the other person get a win. It's my hope that with single party control, sorry Jennifer, Democrats have to understand this is their problem to solve, and I hope that that will allow, uh, and I believe it will too, Jennifer, okay. um, that they will come forward and say, you know, some of the stuff we were dealing with from a political perspective before, we now have to deal with from a poly policy perspective. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can get some of the politics behind us and really see some solutions. All right, thank you so much for that. So I want to open this up. Uh, so my, my request of you, if you have a question, please come to the microphone, say your name, say your school district, and uh, speak your issues. So, Thank you. Uh, Tony Sanders. I'm the CEO of School District U46 in the Elgin area. Um, thank you, first and foremost, for passing the evidence-based funding model. Uh, on behalf of my district, uh, that fought very hard for the bill. Uh, we really do appreciate the, the added revenues. And it is going now to support kids in the best way. Uh, but part of that bill also eliminated seat time for students. And there's already a scuttlebutt of a bill coming back forward in the spring that would undo that. Um, so I'd like to know, if, do you support letting school boards make that decision locally, what constitutes instructional time? And also, are there other flexibilities that you would consider giving school districts? Yes, support it being school board and um, would like to have thoughts from you guys on what other flexibilities you'd like to have. My name is Dan Walter. Um, I'm from. Wait, did you guys want to answer that? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's, right. that's okay. No, that's right. Go, go uh, just quickly, yeah, um, Tony asked that that bill has. It'll probably come to me in regards to uh, putting in some minimum hours as we've had in the past. Again, yes, I, I'm open for flexibility. I would just have to hear uh, what those uh, those are. Call me. Yes. <laughs> you know, similar answer to that. I think it's good to give flexibility to local school boards, and if it bill makes it past your committee, I'll look forward to reading it. <laughs> and I, 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 oh, they can pass mine. <laughs> we don't worry about us. Um, I do joke, and I probably should joke this way. I said we don't have minimum hours for the school day, but we do have minimum hours for PE, so we're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Good job. Well said. <laughs> Get me all hands coming. <laughs> My name's Dan Walter. I'm a school board member for Peoria Public Schools. Proud to say Senator Weaver is my senator. And uh, while we're not partisan, I'm a Democrat, he's a Republican. He has been so receptive to helping Peoria Public Schools. And I just want to appreciate that, Senator. He's going to pass that. Get past the R and the D, it gets to issues. And issue, education's been a big issue for him and for us. I'm going to ask you maybe a question that may not be an easy one to answer. You talked about the budget deficit and where we're at. I'm asking you to look at some revenue enhancements, including legalization of marijuana and sports betting. Um, I know they're not popular in a lot of places, but I have friends in Colorado that it has been a boom for, for Colorado. The state of Washington's just started it. With where we're at with the pension, and I understand what Denver said, that we're not going to be able to get the income tax, even if it does go through, that's not an immediate process. Um, I would just like to know your feelings on revenue enhancements. Well, obviously those are, are two big issues for, for revenue, and I can just share with you my, my personal opinion that I have supported sports betting um, in the past, and I will continue that. Uh, legalizing marijuana, plug your ears, Quinn and I'll get back there, I see you. Um, I, am, I am just a little more concerned with that because of the public health uh, issues, and I think we need to take a bigger look at that before we uh, jump into legalizing it just for revenue. I'm a Democrat too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with that. I think the um, sports betting is something that, that was recently opened up to states by a United States Supreme Court decision. So it's a relatively new option that we could pursue. And I think it's something that is worth pursuing. Um, I, I share um, Senator Bertino Terrence's uh, concerns on the uh, legalization of marijuana. Um, I would also say that we have to be a little careful as we talk about some of these new revenue sources. It seems like you know, the, the, these suggestions that are being brought here at this education conference are the same suggestions that are being talked about to fund a capital infrastructure bill and the same revenue sources are being talked about to fund uh, expansion uh, of the Medicaid program and many other things. So the, uh, even if we do get a dollar in, it can only be spent once. And uh, there's a lot of people who, who uh, have their eye, have their target on those, uh, those new revenue dollars. Thanks. Um, Sports betting, I'll take a look at. Uh, recreational marijuana, I won't, I won't be supporting. I've done the math on that, and you know, you see a lot of different information out there, and, and I don't know how much we can believe on both sides, frankly, uh, pro or against. I think there's a lot of misinformation. But I think the cost of that long-term offsets the benefit we get from it, personal belief. Um, something where I think you will see, uh, capital bill is briefly mentioned, and uh, there'll be a revenue uh, attachment to that uh, motor fuel tax. I hear two numbers out there for that: thirty-seven billion dollars for uh, roads and bridges. That's called your horizontal infrastructure. There's also about another seventeen, they're, uh, thirteen. They're talking about thirteen billion for uh, vertical infrastructure, which might be things to help uh, universities that type of thing. Uh, the number that's out there is as much as uh, fourteen cents a mile for a motor fuel tax increase and uh, also a, a sales tax increase on fuel that would go with that. And there's a little more complexity on that piece if one of the pieces of tax goes away. So I think when you start looking at all those things, um, we're a high tax state and I still think we need to be focusing on the uh, spending side a lot more. Tim Forker, Superintendent of Lundsfield Schools. I'm also fortunate enough to be Mr. Weaver's district and he's on well represented. <laughs> Be more kind than the last one. It's very nice that he puts it on his. Be more kind. He can get it kinder. That was great. I'm not declaring my party. I'll just be quiet on that. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One, with regards to uh, licensure, teacher licensure, um, just just hoping that reciprocity is here to stay and wanting to hear your, your thoughts on that. And then in an entirely different uh, topic, with regards to health insurance loss runs. Is there any talk legislatively in passing some type of a law similar to what Iowa has so school districts can have access to health insurance loss runs as we go through the rule each year? Yeah. Uh, so I'll start with that. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Iowa law. I'd, I'd be happy to take a look at it, though. I know that um, you know, as school districts are major employers, you're certainly struggling with the rising cost of health care like employers across the state and across the country are. I think we uh, really should look uh, closely at what we can do in Springfield to help reduce the, um, the growth in health care uh, insurance costs. That's a, that's a major part of, I think, one, you know, making it difficult for you to make 
your, your budget work, your, the, it's an added financial pressure for you, but also as we talk about uh, you know, trying to improve teacher salaries and trying to improve uh, wages and compensation for an individual, a dollar that you're spending on increased cost of providing the same type of benefits program is something that you're not able to invest on in increasing wages and salaries. And so if we want to try to have growth of wages, growth of take home pay for individuals in your industry and every other, uh, one of the best ways we can do that is to try to give you tools to control the cost of your uh, benefit package growth. And so I'd be very happy to take a look at that. Um, I, I don't recall the first part of the question. Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Yeah, I think I, I'd be supportive of keeping reciprocity in place. You want to go? I don't, I don't I guess to reciprocity. Um, I'm not familiar with the, the Iowa program either. I'd be happy to take a, take a look. Yeah. Um, don't understand the health loss overrun. We'd love to hear more about that from you. With regard to reciprocity, uh, and just for people that may not know that terminology, it's where a teacher who's uh, taught elsewhere can come into the state of Illinois and teach without more uh, licensure eff efforts. And there is a person in my district, uh, a woman, whose husband was sitting home taking care of kids because he could not teach in Illinois even though he taught 17 years in Nebraska. So that's what that was trying to solve that problem. Uh, when I was working with the Illinois State Board on that bill, um, I was real excited when they said yes to it, and then I thought, wait a minute, how many states don't have the level of expectations that we have? And I asked the question, I said, wait, we're willing to do this, but are there some states that we should not allow their teachers into Illinois? And uh, I, I think it was a, an adult answer. They said, you know what, we have a big enough teacher shortage let's come back and visit, let's get this thing passed now and then come back and visit whether there's some other states we should limit. So I've been having further conversations on that, on what is it that, that, that is the standard that we have to have. I know EdTPA is not a popular thing, there's a lot of frustration about that, but that could be one of the things that you're looking at as uh, the leveling factor. So there may be some things that need to happen with reciprocity, probably not in the next few years because we got a pipeline to fill yet. Uh, Eric Koonsman, I'm from uh, the Riggsville Perry School District, which is about an hour uh, west of Springfield, for those who don't know. I want to talk about pre-K funding. So as you should know, uh, we went through the grant proposals here this past summer, five-year grants. Uh, most education money, we want to think about getting it uh, where we need it. We're in a high poverty area. We did not get that grant. Um, so we need to figure out a solution with either additional funding, some way uh, to help those kids because in, in high poverty areas uh, we can't charge those kids to come the kids that need it the most are being left behind so just thoughts on uh, either additional funding or additional options thank you just last week um, senator weaver and i participated in a subject matter hearing just on that very topic regarding the competitive grant of early childhood i i I think we would be in agreement that we had a pretty strong commitment from the entire committee that moving forward, that that is not the way to go in regards to the grant process, that we need to look at implementing it into the, the formula that we have now. We talk about the prior, the, the need and the importance of early childhood, um, childhood programs, but at the same time, we really cut the, the legs out of some of the school districts that needed it the most. So that was a flaw. We've recognized that flaw, and there's a commitment to fix it moving forward. Will it take five years to get it fixed? Pardon me? Will it take the, the five years? No, no, that was even actually a question that Senator Weaver asked, and I'll let you respond to that because that was very that important. How long are we going to have to wait? And then these districts who did receive it, what happens to those? So I'll, I'll let you, you asked that question in committee, Senator Weaver, so I'll let you give their answer if you call yeah. it. Um, I want to try to remember that piece, but I want to come back just a second on uh, something that came out of that committee that I think surpri surprised me, it may not have surprised uh, Senator uh, Bertino Tron, but um, this was a competitive grant process. When it happened, uh, I had seven of my seven people in my district contact me very angry because they lost their money and uh, ISB, Illinois State Board of Education, was getting beat up over this competitive process. It was a legislative directive that it had to be a competitive process and it always been a competitive process. They just changed the way it was being done. 
what came out of this meeting last week was that it needs to be more of an evidence-based model, that it's not about a competition between districts, but rather a standard that ought to exist. So there is general consensus that we need to be talking about uh, what that is. And so first thing is, what's the standard? Second thing is, how do you fund the standard? And then the part that kind of hits you in the face is, wait a second, if we're going to change this to a new process and change it from something that's not a competitive grant process, how do you hold harmless all the people you just made a five-year commitment to? Because that was one of the problems before, is we had changed a prior commitment and kind of caught people off ground. Another thing I, I threw out, and I, I may not have said in that committee, I've been thinking about it with folks, and what happened last year was, I don't remember the timing exactly, it was probably about May or June that people were told what was happening, and I had a person in my district that hired people for that grant in March. So you're shaking your yes, that's about the right timing. So my question was, first, you've got to, if you're gonna change the process, that's one step. Second thing is then you gotta have the scoring, and the third step is the timing on funding. I think we ought to be able to come up with the process, but then make sure that the scoring is done early enough that people aren't getting pregnant with new hires uh, prior to when the funding's happened. So there's a lot of pieces of this thing that, that have to, has to be changing. Hope I didn't confuse that more than it was before we started. I, I'm glad to hear we got two great senators working on this. I, I share their concerns. I certainly heard from in my district about the same kind of situation and uh, be supportive of uh, getting some resolution to that. It sounds like we sort of got a running start on that already, which is a really positive thing. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm a school board member for uh, District 73 question is about school funding. So with the evidence-based funding, there was a little bit of new money, but overall, the state share of school funding is still on the lower side compared to many other states, which means our local funding is on the high side, a lot of high um, taxes in our district. Um, so my question is, what can be done going forward to flip that, to have the state increase their percentage of school funding to give some um, relief, so to speak, to the local taxes. Um, to me, it seems like one side's gonna have to be open to more revenue, and the other side's gonna have to be open to some spending discipline. So, what do you guys think about that? Um, so, $7 billion is what it takes to properly fund the evidence-based model, $7 billion. Um, you may have liked or not liked the governor around One thing he did do is give her a proration. He was adding $350 million a year. And I know there's a commitment for that $350 million to continue. The goal uh, in statute is that by 2027, we're fully funded on the evidence-based model. That will not happen if we're doing $350 million a year. So if we're going to get there, it's going to have to take more dollars. But it's actually $7 billion. And if you think about a budget right now that is uh, – 37 billion, correct? That's a big number to plug it in, so it's gonna to have to happen over time. And I, I guess, um, you know, I'm a, I've got a passion for education. When you think about a budget, in my mind, the, the first thing that's gotta get done is education. Probably the second thing is infrastructure, and then after, those are two things the state's gotta do, and then after that, the, the bar kinda of drops on some other things. So um, it's gonna come down to how we prioritize. Yeah, that's, that's well said. It's, it's going to take time. It's also, as I mentioned before, there's a number of um, competing uh, priorities that we have in, in where new dollars are going to go. And so I think it's going to take a, an ongoing commitment from uh, legislators uh, in, in this General Assembly and General Assemblies yet to come, people who are yet to be elected. Um, it's going to take a commitment over, over a course of time. This is not something that the state has any ability to financially uh, make that happen right now or even in the next couple of years. Um, so this is really a, this is really putting ourselves on a process and trying to build in that this is something that we agree in a bipartisan way is a top priority that happens each and every year. And just add, that's why we need to ensure that we said there's a minimum of 350 million. That will take a long time, the, the, the 10 years. So um, we have to remember that that's just a, a floor, um, but we, we are incorporating a lot of other difficulties in that as well. But I do hope to continue to see um, legislators prioritize that minimum. We are we are grossly negligent as a state in funding education. Good afternoon. Um, Tiana Cervantes. I'm actually from District 205, CEOSD 205 in Galesburg, also in Representative Weaver. 
my question's a little bit different. Um, I'm an elected official, and I've been elected to do the job of helping to set policy for my district. The example that you gave earlier, Representative Weaver, was actually a former board member who couldn't get a policy passed while she was on the board, and then as a parent, approached the board and circumvented our conversations and went to her representative to get an answer that she wasn't getting from her board. So from my position as an elected official, help me understand how, as an elected official, we can also work with you as an elected official to still do our job um, and that it not be a competition of sorts if our citizens are, are our and our constituents aren't getting the answers from us that they want put in. And it gets directly to me, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take it. Um, answer every phone call, happy to sit down, uh, all the dialogue you want to have. Um, I think that was a, I think it is really critical that if a student has the ability to get dual credit um, and they're also doing all they need to do to be able to stay on top of their um, education with regard to what the high school requires that they have that right. So that was, I felt it was a statewide issue. Um, nobody else reached out to me other than Molly, but if there was a way we could have solved that locally, I would have loved to have done that. And I'm going to add to that too, because that is that is a very valid point. And I mentioned earlier that we've seen over 200 bills that have been filed to go through the education. And many of those are um, the result of something happening in a school, a school board. Um, and truthfully, uh, you know, that's part of our job is to look over those bills and decide what we're going to move forward, what we think we can uh, talk to the, the legislator and try to have it resolved locally. Um, I, I kind of it's a tongue-in-cheek, another tongue-in-cheek answer. People don't want their elected officials involved until they want their elected officials involved right. and make bigger change. I would say in that instance, that was something that did impact many people, um, many school districts, many families, and I think it received wide support yes, in, in the end. But no doubt there are issues where that happens, and we are elected officials. That may not be the approach I, I take, but other elected officials, they listen to their constituents, they feel like their school board isn't listening, um, and they take the next step. And it's really a personality trait of the, of the legislator, um, how they handle those. I do take pride in the fact that we really try to address those issues, whether now this is just a situation um, that someone's not happy with, let's, let's not handle this. Um, but recognize too then we get pressure from our colleagues who are elected officials and say the same thing. I'm an elected official, I want that bill, you have to listen to it. And it, for some situations, um, people will vote for it because they don't understand, they, they think it's a good concept. So it's a lot of behind the scene work um, that we are trying to stop things like that. I could say from our perspective, and that we're just one committee that we do try to look at that and try to you know, categorize what is just a personal issue as opposed to what may impact other families in other school districts. We are up against our, our three o'clock timeline, but I know I got two gentlemen here that, that want to ask a question. I just wanted to let everybody know, so I, they'll, they'll stick around and answer that question. So. Uh, but I, I want to make sure everybody, if, if you're on a, a schedule or timeline, know that it is 3 o'clock. But go ahead, gentlemen. Yeah, my name is Tim Casey. I'm with the Marker District 60, which is in DuPage County. And as far as revenues go to help fund education, we're kind of dancing around the elephant in the room, which we know from the governor-elect would be a progressive income tax. And since he doesn't know how much he really wants, he's going to come talk to you fine folks about it. You're going to work that out. So I'd like to hear you tell me what your thoughts are about that, and if you manage to open the Constitution in 2020, might you also consider adjusting the pension clause so you're attacking the problem from both a revenue and an expense point of view? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big question. <laughs> Four or three o'clock. <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't support a, a graduated income tax, um, and so I, you know, I think we've got to look at it in the context of individuals aren't just paying pro uh, income taxes, they have property taxes, sales taxes, you know, every other cost of, of living in Illinois. Um, I think when you add that up overall, the tax burden in Illinois is, is relatively high. Um, so I, I wouldn't support um, putting that question in the Constitution. 
uh, ditto, wouldn't support a graduate income tax. Um, I was pleased to hear that if he did it, and I mentioned this earlier, it would go to solving pension problem. That that would be an encouraging thought, because I think it would help do it. I don't think I'd still vote for it, but I would love it. That was the conclusion if it came out. Um, interesting on uh, pension. There's one word that's missing in our Constitution that a number of other states have. Our Constitution says you cannot diminish pensions. A lot of states say you cannot diminish accrued pensions. Doesn't seem like that's one word, but it makes a big difference. And I think everyone in this room agrees you should never diminish an accrued pension. If you have earned it, you've got it. But the problem is you have people in the system that have started, they may be very early in the system, and constitutionally in Illinois, you cannot change once they've started that pension system. And uh, it's got us into a heck of a spot, and we all know businesses are doing more 401ks and that type of thing. We gotta figure out how to get that a little more, more balanced in the uh, public sector. All right, last question over here. Uh, My name is Jim Davis. I'm a school board member of Newark District 66 in Cotton There was some talk of modifying the pizza law to allow for a high water mark um, in the levy. Is, is that still a consideration, or would you support that? I, I have not heard that. You are the first time I'm hearing that at, as well. That has not been a discussion that we've had at the legislative level. All right, would you support that? Those are um, those are a little, little more complicated <laughs> than just a, a yes or, or no answer. I'd have, you know, again, it impacts. Um, differently so I would hate to just on something I'm not familiar with I'd hate to comment on that and that's a good politician answer isn't yeah it? I, I'm sorry I, I agree with that this sorry. is the first that, uh, that I've heard of that proposal I'd, I'd have to look at it yeah. we'll stick around come on up and I want to hear your thoughts a little bit okay uh, Great. all right thank you thank you very much